Most of you know uh, I am Virginia Lankus, the Career Development Specialist in the Bioinformatics program here. And um, our Thursday conferences <laughs> have been great at highlighting the research that goes on internally. Um, my purpose in bringing our three illustrious speakers here today is to kind of expand your perspective. Um, to see exactly what industry is doing in terms of research, innovation, and how the science is being translated into products, services, and policy in some cases. On the computational and the clinical side, I've tried to include both today. So, um, and since I am the quasi-moderator here, kind of like last night in Nevada, in case any of you watched, um, <laughs> I'll be kinder. Um, after. I'd ask you to hold your questions, um, and then at the end, I'm going to get to ask three questions first, and then I will turn it over to the rest of you, huh? Okay? So Bill is going to introduce now from left to right Dr. James McCormick, Dr. Vahela Solari, and Dr. Anthony Lee. Great. Thank you, Virginia. And um, thank you for organizing this. Um, um, these are always. Um, uh, well-attended events. I'm sure the pizza has nothing to do with it, as, as we've learned in recent months. But um, anyways, um, th this is interesting. I, I hope not only for um, uh, students and fellows, but, but also for faculty to um, hear what, um, well, one of our grads, one of our kind of longtime adjunct faculty, and um, a new friend to the department uh, will have to say about uh, working in industry. So yeah, I'm just going to do these introductions really briefly. Um, so um, Dr. McCormack, maybe some of you know when he was here as a PhD student and an NLM fellow and um, graduated from the program and has um, uh, gone on to um, a number of different jobs. He actually did some teaching as an adjunct faculty um, as well. His um, uh, dissertation work applied human factors engineering to the socio-technical factors that shape local workflows. And he currently is director of clinical informatics at the Central Oregon Independent Practice Association in Bend, uh, which I imagine he'll talk about. Um, in the middle is um, Dr. Rahela Salari Natera, who is director of bioinformatics at Natera a company where she leads a team working on ctDNA-based tests for monitoring cancer. She has 10 years of experience in cancer computational biology, developing computational methods and analytical techniques for understanding the genetics of cancer, which we know is uh, getting increasingly important. She has a PhD in computer science from Simon Fraser University up the road in British Columbia with a background on data structure and algorithm design. She also spent some time after her PhD at the National Center for Biotechnology Information, NCBI, which is part of the NLM. And she was a um, research fellow there and postdoc fellow in, Batsagalo, in the Batsagalo lab at Stanford University. I hope I pronounced that right. And, and then our uh, third panelist, um, again, uh, many of you know because she has um, intermittently taught and participated in research projects around the department for a number of years, Dr. Nancy Vukovic, who currently works at Cambia, uh, focusing on understanding computer uh, consumer needs and using human-centered design to drive innovation. Um, many of us know her for her long-standing work at Intel, where she was part of the Health and Life Sciences Group and worked on technology solutions to support providers. She holds a PhD in medical anthropology from the University of Arizona. So I will turn it back to them. All right, by unanimous vote, I'm, I'm first up. <laughs> so the, the non-informaticist gets to be first. Um, and as you heard, I'm a medical anthropologist. And so in a way, a computational analyst, but using completely different kind of data than you might be accustomed to. But still um, kind of looking at a lot of diverse information and trying to make some sense out of it. And so I think that that's where we have some alignment. But what I'm going to be talking to you about today is a couple of places that I have worked, um, Intel and now at Cambia, and our use of informatics um, as we uh, try to either develop project products or to develop services in the case of Cambia. But um, let's get into that a bit. 
So um, at Intel Health and Life Sciences, we uh, used computational analytics to help define some of the, um, to help advance, I would say, some of the work that we were doing in both genomics and in imaging. Um, to develop algorithms that might help to diagnose pathology in imaging and also to work with a lot of the folks here actually um, to understand more about genomics and how we could apply AI to understanding of that massive data set. Uh, we also used it in a slightly different fashion to help us with some product design. We did a lot of work when I was early at Intel in the space of caregiving and aging in place. And so we were looking at questions about how can we use ambient data or data collected by sensors distributed throughout a home to help do things like diagnose decline very early, even before it was clinically identifiable, and also to help to identify who might be at risk for things like falls. So once again, we had our scientists taking diverse sets of, of information and trying to find patterns in it, trying to understand how we could develop um, services and products related to that that could be um, implemented in the home or in a more clinical setting. Um, a lot of the work that we also did was on how to use that data to um, help not only caregivers in the sense of professional caregivers, but also family members in terms of doing things like reminding people about medications that needed to be taken or to be able to identify when things like appliances were left on or doors were left open once again in the service of kind of defining what a product space might look like in terms of caregiving or aging in place or even chronic disease management. So um, that was, um, I was doing like a lot of drinking about, from the fire hose at that point about technology as well as informatics and trying to understand how the insights that we were deriving from watching people on the ground do their, go about their daily life, the information we were getting from the sensors in people's homes were establishing something that amounted to ground truth and that could then be used to build these kind of services or products that made um, valuable resources available to people um, throughout both the spectrum of, of individuals as well as, as professional caregivers. The kind of use that I see informatics um, having at Cambia is slightly different. We do have a consumer products division and they're using some of that information for product development, but I see it more from an organizational perspective being used um, in my current situation. I, um, I interface perhaps a little bit less on a day-to-day -day basis with, with our informatics folks, but still have a good awareness and, and working relationship with them. And their um, insights really uh, provide a lot of information to the organization as well as to uh, individual groups that might be trying to plan services or products. So on a, you know, a daily basis, there's information coming to us about um, how our members are using particular kind of services, as well as how our internal systems are responding to member needs and other kinds of business needs. So that becomes a vital part of decision making, it becomes a vital part of our strategic planning in knowing how these different kinds of operational things are working so that we can make adjustments to them as needed, resource them appropriately, or to make changes in terms of either you know, vendors we might use or the, the process we go about training our people to provide different kind of services. So I would say that you know, it, it's really kind of an integral part of the business that we do, um, not only in planning for the future, but in monitoring on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, a little more in depth about the kind of skills that our informatics teams have um, within Cambia are that uh, really there, there's also obviously understanding of advanced analytics, but also things like how you would use data analysis um, applications, how you do data, data extraction, all the kind of stuff that you would imagine someone coming out with a degree in informatics may have. But I would also say that there's, um, in addition to all of that, there are skill sets that we're looking for that kind of span um, uh, these kind of more technical kinds of, of tools that you might have or understandings that you might have and learn in a classroom. And those have to do with more of how you um, interact with our customer base, so are you customer focused? So not just this is the information, but how might we use that to change what we're doing? And that's, that's where my team and these teams interface. So we might be able to understand, for example, that there's a problem with people accessing data off of our website and being able to use that in some actionable way. That would then come to folks like my team and our digital team to say, how might we improve that? What kind of human-centered design processes might we use to make a change in that? and then how can we use informatics to monitor whether those changes are actually having a positive effect on people. Uh, but there's also, um, as part of the values, I would say, um, that we have as an organization within Cambia is, is 
kind of looking at how we might use the information that we develop in a way to maybe enhance trust with our members as opposed to um, degrade that. So we have a very strong interest in how we, if we're using patient data to create personalized experiences, how we are also protecting that data and not selling it, not doing other things that might be uh, not necessarily acceptable to our membership. So there's, there's um, a heavy emphasis on that as well as within the organization. And you know, um, I would say the other um, aspect that is a very important consideration is using this information for problem solving. Again, not just a flag that something's happening here or something's happening there, but being able to look across those flags and say, there's something systemic going on here. What do we need to do to change how we're doing and how, we, how might we approach that differently as we go into the future? Um, the other piece that we are strongly moving toward, um, and I think this is really how the workplace in general is, is moving, is again, not just that an informaticist in one department might flag something and someone else over here might, uh, but either in identifying it or identifying the solutions for that, how can we be cross-functional and collaborative across our different divisions to make those a more efficient as well as effective kind of solution that we're driving toward. And once again, that's where my team interfaces and when we're looking at you know, how can we apply human-centered design methods, how can we think about the design of this in a way that is collaborative and more systemic than just kind of one-off <coughs> point solutions. The last thing I wanted to point out to you was, because um, I know we were talking about skills and what kinds of things, how informaticists might be able to step into a more, um, uh, less of a research setting and more of a, a sort of corporate setting. And what I was looking at here is something that came from the, uh, the Future of Jobs report from the World Economic Forum. And it's talking about transitions in terms of skill sets, not just hard skill sets, but soft skill sets that people need as we move into um, 2020 and beyond. And I think what you're seeing here is a shift between those two categories is really an advancing of things like not just um, how you do complex problem solving, which is something that your degrees and the work that you're doing here should certainly enable you to have, but also critical thinking and creativity. Because again, the kind of solutions that are really going to be effective moving forward are not just like point solutions that, okay, we, we're fixing this problem, but looking very critically at what's the real root cause of this? What is the real problem here? And, and that's again where um, the interface with design thinking comes in play because that's, that's a core tenet of, of doing design thinking, is not just looking for a surface problem, but really looking at the insights beneath it and what are the core problems. So I think as you develop that in the kind of work that you're doing, you might think about it in the work that you're doing in a very um, sort of prescribed kind of way based on the kind of uh, <coughs> um, assignments that you have or even a thesis or dissertation that you're working on. But I would invite you to kind of like look at other things as well. Look at how it might be approached from a different perspective, a different uh, discipline, and see how incorporating some of that thought process might make you, uh, help you to come to a richer solution based on looking at what the core problem is at. So with that, if there are any questions now, we're happy to entertain those along the way. I know there's going to be time afterward as well. But that... Oh, that's my job. I'm closest to it. I'm going to just start uh, telling uh, the story of like how uh, I got to where I am today. Um, um, I, uh, when I was in my high school, I found that I have a very, very special interest for mathematics. So I was enjoying doing math more than anything. Um, that might sound lame, but I'm going to tell you that I was not that, into, <laughs> that much into art. I was not that much into music. I was not into video game. I was not uh, really doing other things that most teenagers uh, would enjoy. But I was um, uh, a lot enjoying just doing mathematics. Like I would spend my weekends basically going to library, getting some advanced uh, uh, mathematic books that would people do in college and just read it. Okay? Yeah, that's what I did. Um, so based on that, my high school teachers, they recommended me I should do pure mathematics for college. But I was like, mm, no, that's not what exactly uh, uh, would fulfill me. I want to do something that's more applied because I want to see the effect of it on people's life. 
And um, so I, after like thinking a lot, I chose uh, computer, computer engineering, uh, which I think it was a very um, smart and lucky <laughs> move for me back then. I did my undergrad, and I, I definitely enjoyed uh, learning um, computer engineering, coding uh, through the nights, and just debugging my codes. But um, again, I feel that, OK, this is not enough. I might be able to go and work for like big companies, like, um, like for example, Google. But is this really what I want to do? I want to do is, I was thinking still I want to do uh, something that has uh, more effect and, um, uh, people's life. So I ended up choosing bioinformatics. And again, like, that was a great, uh, it didn't end up great for me. I enjoyed doing my PhD, and uh, after that, I could have stayed in um, academia and do uh, more research and keep publishing uh, scientific papers. But I felt like uh, when I was talking to my mentors, I told them that I want to be part of a product. I want to see. I want to do the research, of course. I want to do innovative stuff, but I want to be part of a, a development of a product. I want to see um, that one day there is a product that I uh, contributed into developing it. It's in the market, and people are using it. Either it's like, I don't know, development of drug or test. I want to see that people are actually using it, and that would be great for me. So what happened is that I, jo I joined um, Natura in 2014, and I. Uh, I was in the research team, and I was working on like different um, ideas that what uh, that we we had for building a test for cancer monitoring. Um, we 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 were successful in building a prototype. It was just like basically the um, codes that I uh, that I wrote, and I worked with our biology team. Um, we te for our first real patient, we tested it on one of our uh, co-workers uh, dad sample. Uh, his father had cancer, and we just wanted to see how this cancer treatment is going, if uh, the treatment or chemo is working for this um, person or not. Uh, I remember that I just like used my uh, prototype codes, and I uh, analyzed the test, and I saw the result. And I walked to his desk, and I told him that, oh, I think I am done analyzing your dad sample. And I am very, very confident uh, that your dad is um, cancer-free. The sample looks clean. Um, he stood up and he hugged me. It was the day before Thanksgiving. And he was just so excited and said, Rahela, this was the best you could have given me just the day before Thanksgiving. I'm going to just deliver this message to my family, and that's the best. And on that day, I felt like this is it. I'm ready to die. I got what I wanted to, <laughs> to do in life. I'm, I'm good. Uh, and it, it's. Uh, for me, it, it was really like that. I, I wanted to see that if um, I finally I contributed making something that um, it has real effect on people's uh, life. So I'm going to give you uh, an introduction to um, uh, Natar. I'm going to go over like our main products, and I will stop uh, and point into where uh, bioinformatics can contribute uh, to each product. OK? Um, our company started in 2004 um, based on a personal history. Our co-founder, um, his daughter had, uh, sorry, his sister gave birth to a um, baby boy, and boy had Down syndrome, which died uh, just six days later. This was very devastating for his family, and um, uh, our co-founder decided that, okay, that is not acceptable in 21st centuries. We should have a proper test for uh, Down syndrome. So he came up with a, a um, uh, he, he called a few of his friends, and they just uh, worked together. Uh, and this is sort of, and um, they built a, a genetic testing company. Uh, today, we, after um, 16 years, right, we we've been able to analyze more than two million samples. There are many um, countries around the world who are using our test, and it helps. Um, uh, basically, specifically for uh, women's health and cancer monitoring. Uh, our company is based on very interesting uh, uh, technology, which is a uh, cell-free DNA um, uh, testing, which I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about it later. Uh, it has application in prenatal testing, in 
um, organ transplant as, um, as well as um, cancer. Uh, all the tests that we, we, we have right now in market, they, they have, a specific, they have uh, some license or certificate. Uh, probably you haven't heard about this license or certificates, but these are a few regulations that each test should um, follow. There are specific um, uh, validation that a test should pass uh, or let's say a product, a clinical product should pass to get the specific uh, certificate. This might sound just like progressive and boring, but believe me, it is not that uh, boring even from a computational side. Um, because when, in order to get the certificate, first you really, you need to really understand what is this product and then understand how I can, I can do the validation to pass this uh, the, the requirement. And um, guess who is doing all this data analysis? Of course, the bioinformaticians. It's, it is quite actually interesting to, uh, to understand both how uh, the, the test or the product works and also what are the requirements for each one of these um, certificates. And these certificates are uh, definitely valuable because they uh, they build trust from all around the world and people in different uh, laboratories are uh, willing to use those uh, tests. So now about cell-free DNA. Um, basically, every part of our body, right, when the cells die, they release their pieces of DNA into blood. So now when you get a blood uh, draw from a person, you can see all these pieces of DNA. There is, mm, they're not like a complete uh, mm, uh, genome. It's just into pieces which are about mm, uh, like 150 bases, very short, right? But uh, still, if you come up with a nice uh, workflow and technology, you should be able to um, uh, extract lots of energy, uh, lots of information out of these pieces of DNA. Uh, it has application in prenatal, uh, and cancer, and organ uh, transplant, and that's how our products are uh, built up. So I'm going to tell you. Um, Okay, so how the NIPT test work? I don't know if um, any of uh, uh, women here in this room have got pregnant and have done the test. I, I personally have done this test that I designed myself, which was very interesting. So the way that it works when, when women are pregnant in their blood, uh, not only there is uh, maternal DNA, but also there are um, uh, about uh, like 10% uh, uh, fetal DNA. So the way that we, uh, the test works is that we get a blood draw, then in the lab, uh, from mom, uh, in the lab we extract all these DNAs, which are the mixture of maternal and fetal DNA. It's a mixture. There is no flag on them that says, oh, this DNA is coming from mom, this DNA is co uh, comes from baby. Uh, how it works is that first we, uh, uh, we amplify a specific set of predefined set of SNPs. And guess who chose those, those SNPs? Who went to 1000 Genome um, uh, Genomes Project database and decided that which SNPs are the best SNPs to, to be used for this test? Bioinformaticians, right? And then who designed these primers? Bioinformaticians, again. <laughs> um, so what we do after that, we, we sequence um, uh, the sample and uh, we perform QC, which is designed and um, uh, reviewed by, again, a computational team. And then um, we, we look at the, the imbalance between the uh, allele ratio. Um, I don't know if, uh, have you guys um, ever looked at like uh, next generation sequencing data, but for normal, um, healthy human beings, we expect that all the SNPs are either, they have allele frequency either 0%, 100%, uh, or 50%. But if, when we see something a little bit imbalanced, let's right, say that instead of 50%, we see like 60%, um, it tells you that, oh, you don't have equal amount of uh, both copies of uh, DNA. It tells you that there is some, something going on. So we apply our algorithm and we come up with a risk factor that tells how much, um, w what is the probability that the fetus has some um, uh, genetic um, disorder. 
Uh, I didn't mention the work that other teams are doing. Of course, of course, everybody else in the company contribute to these tests, but I'm just, uh, I just wanted to um, like, uh, point more uh, about the bioinformatics uh, contribution, which I think is uh, helpful here uh, for students here. Okay, so, um, so th there are other companies who are doing this similar uh, test, but it's the, 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 the technology behind it is quite different. They usually look at the imbalance of the amount of reads that they get from a specific region, and if they see more reads or less reads, they would consider it as a sign of amplification or uh, deletion. And again, if, if any of you here ever work with um, an external sequencing data either for um, germline calling or somatic variant calling should be uh, uh, familiar already with different uh, basically tools or techniques that have been used for uh, CMV calling. So let's just skip that and now this is this one is about the uh, cancer monitoring test that I mentioned earlier. Um, um, how, uh, if you want to review the workflow of this one this is a, by any means, by any definition, it's a super personalized test. How it works is that we get a biopsy from, uh, from a person who is already identified uh, and diagnosed with cancer. We sequence that biopsy and we identify specific somatic mutations for that uh, patient and we build a personalized uh, set of assay for this patient. We keep it in the lab and every time in the future, uh, when the patient sends us the blood draw, we will apply this uh, our assay to figure out what is the level of um, cancer basically for this patient. Um, the test is quite nice for patients and for physicians. Why? Because uh, usually right now if a patient has cancer and they go through treatment and they want to see if the treatment is working or they've been cured for so many years, but I still want to know, am I still good? Is this uh, something coming back? Uh, is everything fine? Uh, they need to do either CT scan or MRI, and this type of test, it cannot happen uh, very frequently because of all the cost and um, also the side effect that you might have. Uh, depending on the cancer type, there is a regulation, like for example, for um, colorectal cancer, they can only do this test every 18 months, right? So um, currently, cancer patients with colorectal, they need to wait 18 months to get a green light that, okay, everything is good, everything is um, fine. But with this blood draw, there is no problem. They can do it every month, right? Um, um, it might be too much, but they can do it as often as they want just to have a peace of mind that, okay, um, I am still in, there is no sign of relapse or uh, anything like that. But what makes it mm, uh, also interesting for insurance company and for market is the cost of it. Definitely cost of just processing a blood test is much, much uh, less than doing a um, CD scan. But what is interesting is that at every step of this test, informatics is a very, very important module. At, from the very beginning, analyzing the whole exome sequencing, this is, uh, this, is, uh, mm, this is a computational heavy work. Then basically choosing the best set of mutations and then monitoring them in plasma and calling those variants, detecting them in plasma. These are all computational and informatics modules that need to be done by, um, uh, by people who actually have a background and experience in this world and these people are called by um, right? So there, are, there, there's just a lot of, um, I would say it's, it's a, uh, there's just a lot of work that can be done by bioinformaticians in different, for different uh, products in, in biotech and that uh, makes it uh, uh, more interesting. Um, uh, so at the end, uh, I'll just skip and I would go through like, uh, job description that uh, we have for, bio, for senior bioinformatician scientists at Natera. There, there, there are uh, various requirements, but I would tell you that the most important thing that um, I 
thing as like a, at least like a junior bioinformatician, the person should have is to be comfortable uh, programming. That is like for me, it, it, this is the first and most important skills that is uh, expected from uh, um, computational scientists in this uh, in 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 the biotech, um, and the rest would vary from one company to another and depending on the product. Well, thank you. Um, you, you know, it's, it's been a while since I've been up here, and I, I always forget how I'm such a small data guy by comparison. So we hear these stories about what uh, can be done with big data, the human genome, and so on. And I tend to focus on, look at that white count on patient Joe Smith, so a little, little data. Um, my name is James McCormick, and I'm a graduate of OHSU. And currently, I'm the director of clinical informatics at a large uh, independent practice association in Bend. And we cover quite a range. Uh, we're really the whole swath of Central Oregon, including the Gorge and uh, bits of Eastern Oregon. Bottom line, though, is that we have over 700 clinicians that are part of our IPA. And they range from tiny one-doc solo practices, including a couple concierge practices, all the way up to a very large multi-specialty practice uh, in Bend. Uh, we also are partners with um, St. Charles Hospital, who is not considered an independent practice, but is our partner in an accountable care organization. So a lot of those relationships that we have, including Pacific Source as both the Gorge and Central Oregon's coordinated care organization, as you know, the group that takes care of our Medicaid population, means that we have a lot of data going back and forth between our organization and external ones. And we have to help them understand what's going on within our membership, but also understand what's happening outside of our membership as well at a community level. So it's a pretty big picture. The nice thing for me, though, is that Bend is a pretty straightforward ecosystem. We have one large hospital. They're on Epic. So I've got that in one box. We have a couple large multi-specialty. We've got Greenway. We've got Epic again. We've got Ochin, uh, three different federally qualified health centers, Ochin Epic. So it kind of, for me anyway, starts to put the data in different silos, but accessible silos. And that's really the challenge of a bioinformaticist, or in this case, a clinical informaticist, is taking all of that stuff. So if you were to go through this piece by piece, this is our strategic sort of placemat that we have. Uh, you can imagine these management retreats where everyone goes and brainstorms and comes up with this lovely picture. The bottom line is you're not going to see informatics up there. And the reason is that, at least in my role, informatics is a supportive technology. The mission of COIPA is to help small <laughs> independent practices, large independent practices, manage contracts with payers, like Pacific Source. Uh, we don't contract with Cambia, but we could. Um, and provide what they need in order to manage their populations, to hit the quality metrics they need to hit to be a successful payer. Uh, in addition, we have credentialing. So credentialing involves dealing with things like state provider directory and other IT tasks. Quality, uh, of course, each clinic is very focused on their own quality for various reasons. You might think MIPS measurements, they report their quality measurements and get either an incentive or a disincentive from the government. So uh, there are pay for performance metrics built into a lot of uh, payer contracts now. That means that all of a sudden clinics that focus patient by patient are moving into the world of having to manage a population. And you'll hear population health mentioned over and over again. So in, in my world, what that means is having enough data to be able to know what's going on in your population, and then hopefully start to take that data and be more proactive. And I'll talk about that in just a minute, because it's pretty much the most exciting thing going on right now at COIPA. Uh, more on that in just a minute. So again, uh, informatics is definitely a supportive technology. And I, I don't want to forget the day-to-day -day workflow. Uh, a provider capturing a blood pressure in the office, uh, uh, doing a health screening form for uh, risky alcohol use. All of those things uh, can be informatics tasks. Each clinic may approach them in a different way with a different workflow and a different set of forms. They're going to have different EHRs. They might have a different instance of the same EHR, multiple epics. They might have it hosted by someone like Ochin, where there's some commonality across sites or they could have built their EHR in a completely different way. And I look across my 13 eClinical work sites within the IPA, and every one of them has built their system in a different way, even though they're trying to address some of the same challenges on quality reporting of population health. So the variety of members that we have and the IT platforms that they support within their clinics is a real challenge to doing what we really want to do, which is across region population health. 
So more on this, this gets a little more into the tactics for those strategies. Now we start to get into a little bit more informatics. You'll see down in the little corner there, uh, EHR uh, analysis, where we go into the clinics and help them use their EHRs better. Uh, EHR optimization, and this is a big one. Um, we cannot do uh, a CCO measure. So right now there's a new CCO measure that requires clinics that see Medicaid patients to report uh, alcohol and drug risk assessments. So it's a nice little quality measure. It's got a number, two numbers actually, but it's very hard to get from the EHRs because of the way they've configured the data capture workflows. So a lot of what we do in the optimization, unfortunately, is retroactively setting those systems up or configuring them so they can meet the current demands of the government and their payers. And those of you who track MIPS and formerly meaningful use know that those bars change year after year, so it's a moving target. So one of the challenges for us is to try to align the work that we do and not just follow the bouncing ball or the kind of the next shiny light, which would be, oh look, MIPS just changed something. Patient Center Medical Home needs this new report. Our clinics have to do UDS reporting for this new thing. We have to do those things, but we try to be strategic. And right now we can't do that because our challenge is that this data lives in a bunch of separate silos, as I mentioned. Now, there are some neat things we can do. If you hire a PhD informaticist, you would expect that you can extract data from an EHR. We do that. You can dump it into a new database and analyze it. We do that. But uh, to get back to uh, uh, you know, Dr. Vukovic's point, it has to solve a problem and it has to be sustainable. And I'm glad you mentioned that word because it's right in our mission statement. We have to be able to provide sustainable services. We're funded off the contracts work that we do, the credentialing business we're in, and membership dues. So we have a limited amount of resources that we can spend doing things, and it's got to align with a bigger picture. And that strategy has to be sustainable. So for me to extract data from 13 different e-clinical work systems and dump it into an access database, which I do, because it was my only option at the time, is not sustainable. So what do we do? The exciting thing that we're doing now uh, is we have just selected a vendor of choice uh, for a population health analytics tool specifically for the IPA. Uh, and we've worked with uh, the larger of our members, starting with the Medicaid, just because of the CCO priorities in the region, uh, to feed those data into a more robust population health tool that goes above and beyond what an individual analyst could possibly do on their own. In addition, it starts to get us into more of a pro, uh, proactive or predictive mode. Um, if you start looking at what the population health vendors out there are offering, much of it is retrospective analytics. Can I report my quality measures based on EHR or claims data? Sure you can. But the real value there is being able to apply algorithms and predictive analytics to try to identify patients who are at higher risk for certain conditions and then take that data back to the clinic in a way that they can act on it. So we're suddenly in this weird position of having more data than we can handle, where five years ago we were all whining because we couldn't get data out of EHRs. So it's a good position to be in, but at least in my position as an analyst and not a data scientist is I tend to hit my limits. So I look out at this group, and uh, Ted and I have talked about this before, uh, is that difference between someone who's a data scientist so I want to describe a little bit of how I differentiate the two. Now, there are real formal definitions for this, but I, as an analyst, can work with clinicians and payers and, and come up with the questions to ask. Thanks to OHSU and, and Cerner, to some extent, um, I am trained to query data. So I have the technical stills, skills to be able to crudely extract and analyze data. Where a data scientist would add to this is the ability to know what questions to ask. Now, we have a medical director who's very, very fluent in informatics. She's very smart about this. She knows what questions she wants to know. But I think, as you all know, there's a reality check where what stories can the data truly tell you as opposed to what you hope you can get from just aggregating a bunch of bits and bytes. And there's a big delta. And so I see your role as informaticists is being able to not just do the work of aggregating, cleaning, and presenting data, but being able to help stakeholders like clinicians and payers define the, not only the questions they want to ask, but also the things that the data can really tell you. Now, um, yeah, I'll look at Nicole here, because um, I know she studied this. The data quality we get, for a lot of reasons, coming from EHRs is not great. And, and I could do a whole talk on that. 
But the endpoint is the payers expect us to be able to use it. And I'll just give a quick example. Um, how will I know if a patient's A1C is under control? Payers not going to know that from claims data. They're going to know if an A1C got done. They're not going to know what the value is. So everybody has to have this, this data. So then we decide that we're technically able to pull the data out of the EHRs and combine it. We're done, right? Not so much. What about point of care A1Cs? Are those captured and stored in the same way in the EHR? Some yes, some no. What about A1Cs that never get back to the clinic that might be done by a commercial lab or sent as a PDF uh, or a, a document? Can't mind that stuff either, at least yet. I know <laughs> smart people are working on that. So the challenges of knowing the data at the source and helping stakeholders understand what those data can really tell you is a big chunk of what I do. And I've used the word, and, and it's not very popular, magical thinking. We're going to get this great platform. We're going to turn on all these interfaces, and we're going to be showered with usable insights. Fact is that we already know from our work with the ACO's population health, there are challenges there too. So as informaticists, I think there are four things you really need to know. You need to understand the technology, of course, the mechanics, how to do it. But you also need to understand the, uh, the clinical aspect. How are these data really captured? What is the workflow of doing a, a risky alcohol screen? How, how are those data captured? Is it a form? Is it discrete data in the EHR? And if it is, how do I get it? And then translating that into what the stakeholders really need for actionable insights. So I'm very excited about this. Um, I'll mention that the vendor we chose is, uh, is Arcadia. Uh, we looked at a number of vendors, and it was a very interesting process in just understanding what they can and can't offer. And I will tell you that the holy grail, and this kind of goes, speaks back to both of our, our other panelists, is being able to combine data from multiple sources. What we really want to be able to do is gather insights both from the claims data and from the clinical data in one box, if you will, and be able to take that back to the clinics and drive practice change. And none of those things are easy. And that's all I have. because I get to go first, um, <laughs> have to do, you've already addressed some of you. Um, and I'm gener generally just putting this out there. When you consider a candidate for hire or your organization, what skills and traits do you focus on and what do you consider essential? I know um, Dr. Soleri talked about that. And what, what also do you sometimes find lacking or maybe often find lacking in, in terms of a skill set or a trait set with uh, candidates? Whoever wants to start. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've kind of touched on the big ones. I mean, the technical is obvious. You've got to be able to wrangle data. Got it. Um, uh, clinical workflow I mentioned, um, industry, understanding industry, and under industry I would put the business of this. When you're looking at six different population health vendors and you worked at Cerner for 13 years as I did, you know the vendor tricks. You know what's going to be shown and not shown in a demonstration. You know how to write a request for information to get what you need to make a good decision. That industry knowledge is not easy to come by. So knowing how the industry works when you're engaged with industry partners is important. Um, also, other stakeholders, understanding what the pressures are on a coordinated care organization. We're a unique state that the CCOs are uh, given free reign to do what they need to do with Medicaid, provided they meet certain metrics they've committed to CMS. They've got to hit those metrics. That's serious stuff. And the CCOs themselves are actually paid an incentive based on their ability to hit metrics. That's a, going to be a really key, important thing for them to understand. For Medicare Advantage programs, the star ratings are hugely important. As a clinician, seeing somebody for a sore throat, I'm not necessarily thinking about star ratings. But when I think about my contract with a payer, pay for, for, more, for performance schemes, how that payer is going to distribute those incentives, which the CCOs do, that becomes important. So making that connection with how the finances of healthcare work and how it influences the priorities of different stakeholders all along the way. Um, I would say ethics. There's a lot of discussion right now uh, going on with uh, basically freeing the data, which sounds terrific, 
but the, uh, the 21st Century Cures Act, which potentially could require providers to release their data via APIs to anyone who asks for it with the patient's permission. Now, I won't go into the pros and cons there, but a lot of us feel that there are some ethical concerns with moving that into the app space and out of the HIPAA-controlled environment that's currently there, which is certainly not perfect. But ethics, understanding the regulations, understanding why I can't just go into a clinic and download 2,000 patient A1C records on a flash drive and walk away with it. I need to know uh, what their constraints are. Uh, and then finally, the soft and communication and collaboration skills. Cannot stress those enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Joan Ash in her course talks about bridgers, people who live in multiple worlds. And as somebody with an advanced degree in informatics, you are those people. You get the clinician's uh, constraints, but you also understand the technology and can give them reality checks. So what do people miss? I think they tend to be overly focused on one of the domains I just mentioned. They might be superstars technically, they can script anything, but they don't have a feel for the source data, or they don't have an interest in digging into where that data is coming from and how it's captured. So I think it's that big picture. We're a small organization, so I don't have a business analyst that only does quality measures. I'm kind of that person. A bigger organization might have people that could be that specialized, we don't. And so it's really important that I'm able to communicate with our stakeholders and our practices in the state on why these things are hard and why our clinics are having a hard time providing them. I have to speak for those clinics. That's hard for a pure technologist to do. Thank you. Um, I, I'll underscore that. I think that you know, in our organization, I mentioned some of the, the soft as well as hard skills that we look for, um, as well as I, where I think um, employment in general is moving and the kind of, of information workers that we all are um, need to, the skill sets we need to have. I would say though that um, while domain knowledge and knowledge of the industry is important, particularly as people move into more senior positions, when we're looking at entry level, I would say that the ability, ability and willingness to think on your feet and to learn as you go is really important. So to not just assume that you know the answers, but begin to develop networks and understand who it is you need to go to ask for clarity about what a regulation is or what the process is would be very important. Yeah, um, good point, yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm gonna also talk about just entry level, because mm -hmm. that's what I assume. Um, Fresh, your fresh grad students are looking for. Um, so again, like for me, because I uh, um, we are hiring like uh, technical people, and this is a very technical team. Uh, and I hired already many, many fresh students. But being a <coughs> fresh student, I actually consider it as like a, a positive thing. It's not uh, something negative for me. Um, and as I already mentioned that I want them. Uh, to be really, really good at programming, that is a must-have. There is no conversation okay, about that. But other thing is that I think is missing, and I think fresh students should be aware of, is that it's okay uh, to not know much about industry. It is totally okay. You guys spend all of your life for so many, many years yeah. in academia. You learned. Uh, how to do uh, research, you learn how to do, uh, how to write papers. It's okay if you don't know how to do QA for your software. It's okay. You can learn it, but um, from the very beginning, from the moment that you go for interview and you start your job, um, you need to be aware of that, that you, you're coming with a big uh, um, experience on one shoulder and the other shoulder is empty. You, sh you should be aware of that and you should be open for learning. Um, you shouldn't think that, oh, you know what, I was the best PhD student in my whole uh, year. I'm, I'm going to be the best now. I have to be manager of a team and blah, blah. Um, no, there is a lot of experience that you, you need to give it time. You're still young. You have so many years ahead of you. And be very, uh, very open. To, to the learning process that how um, uh, things in industry work. How, like for example, if you want to build a product that has uh, X and Y and Z requirement, what are the steps um, to build that? And it's totally okay if on day number one you don't know anything about it, but just uh, be open because in a year it's not okay to not know about it, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, great advice. Thank you all. And you've covered the three questions I had. So on that note, I'm going to open it up to anybody who would like to ask a question. Sorry, this is, might be a little bit more technical, but I'm always interested in how you, this is for James, um, uh, the, you mentioned that you essentially collected information from multiple different clinics throughout the whole region. And for me, that's always a, a tricky issue because everyone's running a different system and I don't know how many EHRs you have to deal with. Probably six. Six, six different vendors. Right. And you have to map every single data piece. Is that something that you do pers personally or like how do you approach that? Uh, yes, and it's not sustainable. Yes. It can't be done indefinitely. Uh, the good news is there's some standard content in most EHRs. So my eClinical work systems, I can sort of group those and then map them as a group. And okay. that's true with SNOMED codes and ICDs and CPTs. So there are standard code sets that I pull from that are pretty consistent across sites. But just to give you one example, the problem list in Athena uses SNOMED. Problem list in eClinical works in Epic uses ICD. Mm -hmm. So yes, combining those data sets is very labor intensive. And quite frankly, um, the tools that I have available, um, I've just graduated to Tableau, which is wonderful, but it's not a scripting language. There are techniques that I could be using that I don't know. Right. Um, so short answer is it's wicked hard, and if these population health vendors can help solve that, that's why they're getting the big bucks. Are you thinking about, is, is there any plan to, I guess, expand it to make it more of a standard way to approach this? Or do you know if there's any... It's tough. I mean, a lot of people say that if we were, if everyone in the world were on Epic, we'd be better off because the back-end data model and the front-end workflows would be pretty consistent, and, and we knew where that data was coming from. That's a world that's far, far away. Uh, other people say that we need a standard EHR data model that all vendors should use. They're mm -hmm. not going to reconstruct their products from the ground up on some, you know, academic data model that somebody developed. So I think we're stuck. This is the world we're in. Um, the good news, though, is with Epic success, there's a lot of consolidation. Oregon is almost 100% Epic in its large health systems. That's a good thing. Um, it means that there's still variability in the data, but we can approach extracting the data in the same way. It's a hard problem, and I wish there were a magic solution. There really isn't. Thank you. Unless Campy is found. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this, for, this is for everybody. What would you see are like the top one and two pros and cons of working in industry? Hmm. <laughs> I, I can give you one. I mentioned Cerner. Uh, so before I came to OHSU, I was an executive at Cerner for 13 years. So I was in industry and then before that another software company. So I, I got a snoot full of industry. and. It helps me every day in understanding what our clinics have to face. On the other hand, though, it was a different lifestyle. I think the biggest pro was the variety, the fact that you're in a commercial world, you have a different set of priorities, but you have to align those with what your customers need. So you're going to a different clinic, a different hospital every week, potentially every other day. The learning from that is tremendous. So you get exposure to the worldwide IT world. The downside is lifestyle. It's hard. Uh, and especially if you're in a traveling role, um, it was brutal. And it, and it wears on people. So I think that not into all industry is like that. But when I think of working for a health IT vendor, a lot of those roles are traveling and a lot of those are hard on you. I have the next question. Um, I'll, I'll be putting you all on spot and ask directly if anybody is interested in doing internships with you or you have current job opportunities, what's the best way to approach you? I have cards. <laughs> <laughs> I, didn't ha I don't have cards, but I think my email address is available. And I know that Cambia does offer internships. Um, what's available in informatics, I'm not aware of at the moment, but that could be found out. Uh. Um, for us, definitely both internship and full-time uh, job. Um, uh, both internship and full-time jobs are available. Uh, I put the link for uh, uh, for a career. You can go apply for full-time positions over uh, into into the link that is natara.com slash careers. And for internship, email me. 
Uh, one more question. Sorry, I'm monopolizing the time. James, uh, I'm really interested in the data sets uh, that you have. And uh, if a student wants to use that, uh, what's the process like? The process would be rewriting our data use agreement. <laughs> uh, because for HIPAA reasons, they were, as you can imagine, these clinics are very reluctant to give a third party, even someone they pay, like an IPA, to come in and access all their data. I'll also mention that in order to calculate six of the CCO metrics last year, I had to pull problem lists, uh, you name it. So that's a lot of very sensitive data. We specifically said it would not be used for research. Having said that, though, if you had a unique need for a data set and you were willing, in the clinic, were willing to provide that, uh, if they're an IPA clinic, we could help you get to it. But unfortunately, none of this wonderful data uh, could be used for research at this point because we've excluded it in our, our uh, data use agreements. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Mm -hmm. It is out there, though, and it is accessible. Amazing talks. Uh, Dr. Solari, I have this question for you. How is Signatera personalized? Like, how are you getting that? I understand it's uh, detecting circulating tumor DNA, but how do you make it, like, personalized to, like, individual people? Mm -hmm. um, so when we wanted to uh, have a test that works for most of the patients, so we did a research for one year, and we realized that um, cancer is a very, very random process. Mutations that happen in cancer are very different from a patient to another. Yes, there are some uh, hot spot mutations uh, known for, uh, for, for example, for like breast cancer or for colon cancer, but uh, truly the hot spot is just one or two mutations and it doesn't cover uh, most of the patients. Uh, so we realize that if you want to if we want to build a marker that works for uh, cancer patients, we need to build this marker based on the very specific mutations that each patient has. How do we do, it, do this? We get a biopsy from the, uh, from the tumor. We, we perform whole exome sequencing. We analyze it and we identify uh, variants on, the, on that tumor specific to that um, tumor. And then we we'll build our uh, assay internally. We, we save that assay somewhere in our uh, lab and we put the name of not the name, ID of that patient <laughs> on the assay. So every time we're going to use this assay for that patient. This assay will not work for any other patient. And just because it's truly personalized, that's why it gives us a very um, low limit of detection. So this is going to remain like a lab-based test. In future, there might be a possibility of like a home detection. The patient can just have it. And like uh, you know, like how you do a glucose diabetes testing. So, right, right. So I think it can be. It can be. Uh, but in far future, <laughs> I don't know how far. Thank you. But Wonderful. it can be. And then, how does your model address any um, sporadic mutations within a cancer genome? if you are tracking someone over time, if the underlying genetics of the cancer may have some Changes genetic drift, mm -hmm. how, does, how do you validate your probes right. over time? So, so the hypothesis is that, uh, the hypothesis of cancer evolution is that it usually starts from like one or two special mutation and it just uh, go and um, gain more and more mutations. I don't know if any of you uh, studied cancer evolution or heard about cancer phylogeny, but we can, con we can for each uh, tumor, um, cancer tumors, right, we can imagine a phylogeny that it starts from very specific mutations. It can be SMVs, indels, or CNVs, whatever. And then over time, it just gathers more and more and more mutations. The way uh, that our algorithm for variant selection choose, we just try to find those top ones and follow those top ones. So we, we, we know that if you're following top ones, right, um, um, we should be always like at the source to be able to find this uh, um, ctDNA because uh, supposedly all the cancer uh, cells, they have those mutations, right? Um, it is possible that treatment kills some of the branches, some of the mutations, but 
if a treatment kills the top, top cells, it means cancer is over. Thank you all so much for coming and sharing your information and advice with uh, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.